weeks ago on a, on a, a worship night, on a Wednesday night, uh, a revelation kind of hit me, and I realized that we are in a season of alignment. That is the, this is the year of alignment. And one of the interesting things about being in a year of alignment is in order for alignment to take place, misalignment has to be highlighted. And it can be, at the moment, a disheartening thing when you're expecting everything to be lined up already, when in fact you encounter a, a situation or a circumstance that's out of alignment, you say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so I want to look at a specific passage in Scripture where this took place and what this man did in the midst of seeing and observing this function. It's masterful, and I'm sure that it will teach all of us how to deal with the same thing. Uh, the title for this message is Harvesting Wisdom. I love being in a harvest season because we think of it very literally. And there's blessing in the literal, uh, in literally accounting for harvest. You think of the seed, you think of planting the seed, you think of the saplings, you think of the trees, the vines, the fruit, you can see it. And so all of these things are very encouraging. And what I wanna make sure we're not forgetting is that we're not just harvesting things we can touch. A harvest season is not just about increase that is in your hands. I love that Jesus, as he was preparing himself to do destiny, it said that he increased in stature and favor with men. He didn't just increase in coin. He increased in stature. That which who God created him to be expanded in such a way that it propelled him forward into destiny. And if we're going to expand and be propelled forward into destiny, we have to master this principle we're going to talk about today, harvesting wisdom. Let's go to Proverbs 24. And yes, as I always say, this is one of my favorite verse verses in the Bible. It is. I've meditated on this verse for years but what I found so fascinating, P.T. said a, a few weeks back that he's now looking at the word in a way he never saw it before. And the thing I love about the word is you can take a verse that you have looked at all of your life and one season, one day, if you will allow God to open your eyes in a brand new way, there is a depth to that word that you could not have seen before because it was appointed for you to see it in that moment. And you can take that and apply it. So I look at this verse. It's one I've meditated on for a good number of years. It says, I went by the field of the lazy man, by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it, considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Man, I love that passage. It sounds not as hopeful. <laughs> But the reason I love it is the lesson that it teaches me. The first few times I've read that, I've always thought it was just about being lazy. And so the, the message was simple, just don't be lazy. That was it, just don't be lazy. And for me, that message was something that drove me at a particular level. And you can still find use for things that will move you and motivate you on one level for a time. But at some point, if we're truly harvesting wisdom, there has to come a point where what we have learned means more than what we have already seen it to be. 
as we are growing and expanding, as life is growing and expanding, the meaning of all of the knowledge and the wisdom that we've acquired has to expand as well. I love that we speak of wisdom and we readily speak of chasing wisdom. It's this idea, not that wisdom is running away from you, but that wisdom is expanding. And so once you bump up to the limit of wisdom of that which God has shown you, it has to expand. That's just kingdom principle. That's how it works. God is not going to give you knowledge that will only serve you on one level because God himself cannot serve you on only one level. So his word and his wisdom cannot only serve you on one level. And so it becomes up to us to be masters of the deep. It's up to us to literally dig into the word over and over and over and over. I love that there's only 31 chapters of Proverbs and not 365. <laughs> that means you can read one chapter every day for a month. And then the next month you start again on, on Proverbs 1. And I promise you, every single time you read it, it's going to show you something different even though the words don't change. That's wisdom. See, when we get accustomed to trying to harvest things of the hand, at some point when you're harvesting that which you can only hold with your hands, there's only but so much you can put in your hands. And then your hands are full. You become full. But with wisdom, there is no diminishing return. You can harvest wisdom in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, pass it on to your children, they pass it on to their children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and that wisdom will continue to bless exponentially. That's why I want to make sure that as we head into the second quarter of this year of alignment, that we are harvesting more than coin and clothing and land, that we become harvesters of wisdom because then we truly become a house that has no diminishing return. And by the way, you get all that other stuff too, on top of it. So we look at this verse, and there are four principles I wanna make sure we look at. These are four principles for harvesting wisdom. The first principle we're going to look at is root out laziness. The first thing we understand about this man and the vineyard that he sees, the first characteristic that's pointed out is that the vineyard belonged to one who was lazy. Now, as I use the word wisdom, I want to make sure we have this in our minds. Our running definition with wisdom for this day, I pray that it's for this season and beyond. Wisdom is knowledge married to experience and perspective. Wisdom is when you can marry the knowledge that God has already given you to the experience taking place in front of you, which expands your perspective for what is to come. That's what we're operating with when I say wisdom. So the first thing is we have to root out laziness. Because the verse tells us if we pull laziness out of that verse, that vineyard doesn't look the way it looks. It's actually then a vineyard. You have to think of laziness like a, like a weed. Laziness is a weed that will choke out your harvest. Not just the harvest of your hand, but laziness will choke out the harvest of your wisdom. It's the same mentality that says, I've read that verse a thousand times. It says the same thing. I feel the same way. I don't need to study it or read it again. I already know the meaning of it. Laziness is a weed that has to be pulled out. That is where the, the fullness of the harvest of wisdom can begin to take place. The interesting thing as we look at that verse 
is when you see a land that has not been tilled and you call the person who owns it lazy, the characteristic that imme immediately comes to mind is physical laziness. We think, wow, this poor man just didn't take care of his vineyard. He didn't go out and work the fields like everybody else who goes out and works the field. And now his vineyard is barren and it's desolate. But we need to understand that laziness is just not in the body. There are two other kinds of laziness that are perhaps more deadly to destiny and purpose than laziness in the body. We'll talk about one, laziness of the mind. A lazy mind will kill your destiny before a lazy body does because it is the mind that tells the body what to do. So you can be able-bodied, but if your mind is only functioning on one level, your body is only going to respond to that one level that your mind is telling it to be at. Meanwhile, as, a, as people of God, we're supposed to be going from level to level, from glory to glory, from increase to increase, from harvest to harvest. And we can't do that if we have a lazy mind. This definition of a lazy mind seared into my brain. It's when we settle into routine that, re that reproduces the same results instead of actively seeking what changes can be made to produce increase. It's when we settle for the same old, same old. Knowing that we are called to live on different levels of increase from experience to experience, from season to season, and from generation to generation. But when our minds fall into a lazy trap, and it happens to us all. It can happen for five minutes, it can happen for five hours, it can even happen for five years. When we don't take the time to look at how the processes in our mind are working and say, is this yielding increase? It's not enough for me to just be sustained. God did not put purpose and destiny and life in me to just be sustained. He has called me to have life and life more abundantly. And if that is not the life that I'm living, then there's something happening in the processes of my mind that needs to be shifted and changed. We have to be open to taking a look at how things are working. And when we find that there's something wrong, there's nothing wrong with finding something wrong. It's only wrong if we let it stay wrong. If you see that there is a cycle of thinking that you have that is yielding the same rotten fruit, harvest after harvest, you go out into the fields of your life and the fruit that is supposed to be ripe and ready to eat is rotten and hitting the ground. Something is wrong with your system of thinking. Something is wrong with the harvesting of wisdom system. So the first level of laziness I wanna make sure that we are actively trying to root out is laziness of the mind. There's always a better way to do what you're doing. It's March, I'm sorry, it's April, wow. <laughs> hey, fatherhood brain is real. <laughs> Time will fast forward on you like you do not believe. But it is April, see I got it right that time. Which means we're getting close to summer. You know what that means? Gym memberships go up. <laughs> Fast food sales stay level. <laughs> they don't go down because people still gonna eat. But it's fascinating because what I've had to understand about my own body is I can't do what I used to do. I can't eat the way I used to eat. There was a time where I could eat whatever I wanted I actually got teased about eating whatever I wanted and still being in shape. 
I worked out, didn't matter. I, I wasn't even thinking about how to work out, I was just working out. No goals. <laughs> just working out. What do you do? I work out. No plan for what it is I actually wanted my body to look like or become. I just worked out. I did it out of habit. I did it out of routine. I was an athlete in high school, so I knew nothing more than to train my body. So all I did was work out. No goals. So whatever my body looked like was cool because I didn't have goals. I wasn't looking for big guns. I wasn't looking for quads. I didn't want really strong toes. I wasn't looking for explosion. <laughs> I was looking for nothing else. I just wanted to be quote unquote in shape in a general sense. I ate whatever I wanted. It was crazy. And then 30 came. <laughs> 30 came and was like, mm hmm. <laughs> and 30 snuck up on me. I celebrated 30, and I was like, 30's the new 20, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I partied like I was still 20. I ate like I was still 20, but I started to look like I was 30. <laughs> and I was so stubborn, I was like, man, it's just a, a, a slow metabolism season. It'll quicken up in the spring. I had all the excuses in the book. My favorite one is I have big abs. <laughs> what? Who says that? <laughs> but I was in denial. I was like, there's no way I'm getting older. It's not happening. Nah, 30 is new 20, I'm still 20. I'm gonna eat, work out, like the way I work out. And then 35 came. 35 was not as nice as 30. 35 was when clothes start fitting real different. No more snatch off the rack and run. It was, let me try this on. I think these sizes run small. 35 was hard on your boy. And yet I refused until finally, after you try on that pair of pants that does not fit for the last time, somebody felt that in the spirit. <laughs> finally, I said, I gotta change my thinking. I now cannot run on autopilot. I can't do the same 200 push-ups, I plateaued. I look the same as I did. I'm not improving. In fact, because my body's so used to me doing that workout, it's not even growing anymore. And now my metabolism is slowing down, and it's more than just adjusting what you do. Now I gotta adjust how I eat. I gotta oh, count. <laughs> Heaven forbid I count calories. I have to look at the content of my food, how much sugar is in it, how much fat is in it, how, is there enough protein, are there enough carbs? I, mean, car I have to do these things because if I don't, I'm going to find myself in a place where I won't be able to move. I will find myself very uncomfortable because I have allowed change to take place. The harvest that is supposed to be bountiful and fruitful is going to dry up and hit the ground. I'm going to ask my body to do something and it's going to say no. <laughs> and why would you ask me to do that? <laughs> you're 35, you're not 20. I had to renew my mind. So now, I have to eat differently and I have to work out differently. I don't have three hours to be in the gym. I don't have two hours to be in the gym. I'm a dad and a husband. I'm lucky if I have two hours, <laughs> period, to myself. <laughs> I have to find a way to be in the shape that I want to be in and make the adjustments that need to be made 
to ensure that takes place. But I can't make those adjustments if I'm stuck in my thinking. If my mind is lazy, I will not yield the fruit of the results that I want. <laughs> Baby's laughing at me right now. <laughs> so we have the laziness of the mind that we have to make sure we root out and the laziness of the spirit. That's deadly laziness number two. Now, the laziness of the spirit will go with this definition. It's when we trust our own hand for multiplication more than we trust God's. When we trust our own hand for multiplication more than we trust God's. Now, it's interesting because you would think that that's not laziness because it just means you're working more. But laziness in the spirit is different from laziness in the body. When you trust your own hand more than you trust God's, it's because we're so used to seeing our hands at work and the fruit that directly comes from it. And we rely on it in such a way that we say, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because my hand is producing. Not understanding that God's hand can exponentially produce more than your hand could ever do. When I first came out to LA, at some point, I was working three jobs. One of them was full-time, one of them, the other one was almost full-time, the other one was part-time. I literally was working so much, I would go to the wrong job <laughs> on the wrong day. I would get on the freeway, I'm supposed to be heading to one job, I'm halfway there like, oh my God, it's Tuesday. I'm not supposed to be there, I'm supposed to be on the other side of town. It was crazy. I was working three jobs. None of them was what I was purposed to do. None of them learned great lessons from them, but none of them equated to purpose. So I'm working and working and working and working. And it wasn't until years later till I looked back and said, wow, what an incredible waste of resource and time. It blew my mind because what was I working to do? We're family, right? We could talk about this. I'm in the right place. I was working. You would say to party. I would say it was social investment. <laughs> I was invested in my social life. And so I worked to bear fruit in my social life. <laughs> All of this working just to get to the next social function. And from the social function, back to work. From work, back to the social function. And I think back on it and I'm like, where was the seed money? All of this increase Yet I still found myself at the same place. No increase in possessions, no increase in land, no increase in spirit, no increase in thinking, no increase. I'm the same guy, but I'm working hard. And I dare somebody to call me lazy. <laughs> I work three jobs, how are you gonna tell me I'm lazy? <laughs> Lost your mind. I didn't realize I had lost my mind. Because laziness in the spirit had gotten hold of me in such a way that it said, I have to work these three jobs because I can't trust God enough to fill in for where I need to be. Somebody gonna get free to this today. So I'm just working, 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 working. And God had to just do what he does. He pulled one job from me. He was nice. God was a gentleman. Because he could have been a gangster. He was a gentleman about this. He pulled one job and just looked at me. And I'm like, well, that just means I'm going to go work the other two harder. Still lazy in the spirit because when you're full in the spirit, you say, God, you will provide for my need. 
That's when you take the time and say, God, what is my purpose? What have you called for me to do? And if you tell me what that is, I will do that. And I will trust that as I do that, you will fill in all the blanks that I'm leaving behind me by dropping the purposelessness behind me. He took one job, snatch, now I'm down to two. I said, okay. Then he took the second job, and it got real. Because now my math is real funny. <laughs> because the crazy part is when you work, 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 at some point, your solution is just to work more. You think you're a machine. You're like, well, if I just do some double, triple, quadruple overtime, I can make up for this job that ain't there. Instead of taking the time to invest in a relationship with God and letting him sow seeds in you that will bring forth a harvest that brings forth generational increase. Then he pulled that third job and... I was like, listen, we, we got to talk. I'm thankful I had a prayer life that was beginning to bear fruit because he pulled that third job and I said, okay, you're going to provide. We're not hoping. We're not asking. This is one of those God you're going to do moments. And I have to man up and not be lazy in the spirit and put my hands in it. So the hardest work I did was just to keep my hands out of it. Because that's what I do. Numbers don't add up, I work. The numbers don't add up, mm, no, Lord, you told me, you told, you told me, you told me. You told me. Because God never takes without replacing above what he took. So I had to get over that laziness of the spirit thing real quick. And I prayed that you all do the same. Because all of a sudden, the career that I had pretty much put to the side began to flourish just because I made time for it. And not only did I invest in it, before I invested in it, I invested in me. You can't just throw seed and scatter it for everybody else to take and, and blossom on their own. You need to plant where you are. You need to plant in yourself. You need to plant in your mind. You need to sow in your own spirit. Because the increase that is going to feed everybody around you that you so desperately care about is going to start inside of you first. <laughs> Laziness of the spirit. What clinched it for me is I thought about it, my mom worked three jobs too. Except my mom managed to work three jobs take care of me and I was hungry because I was a growing boy. My two older siblings pay a mortgage on a house and send money back home. Now for those who don't understand what the back home thing is, my parents are Ghanaian. My parents are from West Africa. So it, the understanding is if you have relatives back home and you are working here, you are sending money back home. So my mom is paying a mortgage on a house, feeding three kids, and feeding relatives back home. Three jobs. But she knew what to do and where to place the increase and where to make it stress and she knew, stretch and she knew when to trust God with what to do with it. Meanwhile, I have three jobs here in LA. I'm feeding me, barely. And I have a studio that is smaller than this stage, with the bathroom included. How'd that work? 
one person is managing their harvest correctly and is yielding a vineyard, and then there's me. And I can't figure out why my vineyard is so barren and my stone wall is broken down and my floor is covered with nettles even though I'm working. Body was working, mind sort of working, spirit not working. All three have to work so that you can harvest wisdom and reap in full. So now that we've gotten rid of laziness, let's go ahead on and root that out. The second thing, the second property for harvesting wisdom, hone your perspective. You can't see like everybody else. God works in such a supernatural way that you have to have vision for how he works before you have vision for how the world works. Because when you can see how he works, how he works affect how, affects how the world works. So now you have order. When you see how the world works first, it's going to color your vision in such a way that you cannot see the fullness of God's vision. Hone your perspective. Can we go back to uh, verses, we'll go back to the beginning. Verse 30, I went by the field of the lazy man and the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. We're gonna pause right there. I love this because if this isn't supernatural vision, I don't know what is. Look at how this is described. This man is walking and he sees thorns, nettles, and a broken down wall. Go back to the first verse. I went by the field of the lazy man and the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. He saw a vineyard. This thing was as dysfunctional as it could possibly get. He saw a mess, but still knew it was a vineyard. You can't always look at something in the state that it's in and define its whole existence by the current state. That's supernatural vision. Because had it been me, I'd been like, that's a mess. That is a hot mess. And yet he still knew to call it a vineyard because the structure for the vineyard was there. The properties of a vineyard were there. He had a mind enough to know those two components right there, that's what makes up a vineyard. The only thing missing is wisdom. Too many times we look upon mess and don't understand that that mess that's in front of us is to inform us. I love that he sees this dysfunction and rather than just walk right by it, he said, wait a minute, what is that? Go to verse 31. And there it was all overgrown with thorns, surface covered with nettles, its stone wall broken down, keep going. Oh yeah, here we go. Harvesting of wisdom happens just like this. When I saw it, I considered it well, I looked on it, and received instruction. That's the blueprint for harvesting wisdom. First, when you go about your day, pay attention to your surroundings. Pay attention to your surroundings. There's no such thing as random. We have to stop with that whole, I just, you know, I didn't even, I just walked around the corner and bam, there it was. That's not random. Stop that. <laughs> stop that right now. It's not random. <laughs> There's no such thing as random. There is just purpose that has not been discovered yet. Everything happens to you for a reason. Every person you come into contact with bumps into you for a reason. When I saw it, I considered it, I looked on it, received instructions. Now, 
It looks like he's just standing there staring at a field and God is just raining wisdom down on him. Partially. This word, when you look up the word saw, he's speaking of vision. He's speaking of his thoughts. So where it says, I, when I saw it, he's really saying, I thought about it. So I saw this dysfunction happening and I thought about it. It immediately engaged my thinking, not my judgment. It's very easy to see a mess and call it a mess. And then talk about the people who made the mess. And then want to tell people about their mess. Not realizing that that mess is in front of you, not for you to talk to them, but that mess is to instruct you. We have this urge to tell people about themselves. It's really kind of crazy. And when you think about it, it's its own brand of laziness. Here's how. When you see dysfunction in someone else and you feel this urge to tell someone about themselves, before you open your mouth, <laughs> before you open your mouth, always do a self-check. Because usually what has happened is the dysfunction in someone else has triggered a revelation of your own dysfunction that's either equal to it or parallel. And so this urge to tell someone about themselves is really the urge for you to tell yourself about yourself. But if you tell yourself about yourself, you gotta do the work. Now you have to go through the trial, now you have to go through the transformation. Now we got to get uncomfortable. Now we got to get vulnerable. And all that stuff has got to happen and we got to be willing to do it. It's a lot easier for me to work out me through you. And see if it works. I'm going to give you this sage advice. I'm going to tell you all about yourself. I'm going to fix all your problems. And wait to see if it works. And then if it works on you, then I'll try it. That's a different brand of laziness. And that not only chokes out harvest, it chokes out love and family. When, when dysfunction shows up, it is, a, it is an opportunity to edify. It is an opportunity for both the person seeing the dysfunction and the person in dysfunction to grow at the same time. And so I love that this man saw this dysfunction and he could have just said, you know what, I'm going to tell this guy with this barren bum vineyard all about him or herself. Knock on the door. Excuse me, your vineyard's a mess. Do something about it. It's an eyesore. It's taking down my property value. I love that he did none of those petty things. He instead it looks at it, he says, when I saw it, meaning he saw it with his mind, he considered it. He considered it well. Now, to consider well, this definition is focus. So not only did he think on it, this was not just a passing thought. He focused on it. Ooh, our generation, we struggle with focus. We have destiny and purpose right in front of us, but there's so many things to distract us from it. This man said, nope, this hot mess that is an eyesore, I'm going to focus on it because I'm going to get something out of it. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. This word instruction is not the lesson we're accustomed to think about when we say instruction. Like, oh, two plus two equals four. I got the lesson. I'm out. This word is correction. So this man saw this barren vineyard and something inside of him had to be corrected. I've always thought that this man was just a wise man who saw this vineyard and was like, whew, glad it ain't me, <laughs> and kept it pushing. Oh no, it was him because it says he received correction. For all we know, his vineyard was jacked up too. But the difference between him and the other guy on the other side is that he saw this vineyard and received correction. He got something out of it. He learned something. 
I love it. There are mm, people's mess can be your message if you just harvest the wisdom. So he looks on it. I saw it. He thinks about it. He focuses on it. And he receives instruction. Let's go to the next verse. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. He basically saw the failure that took place and he learned from it. Which brings me to my third point. Value the fullness of your experience. We are quick to meditate on success, and that is a good thing. It's a healthy thing to meditate on success. Meditating on success, studying success, reinforces the successful outcome in your mind so that you are accustomed to it. So now you are creating an atmosphere of success because it's in your mind, you see it. Good. Meditate on success, analyze failure. Meditate on success, but analyze failure. We have to study where things go wrong. Because if we never study where things go wrong, we won't learn how to make the things that are wrong right. I love that he looked at the failure of this vineyard and said, that, my vineyard looks like that, and I need to fix it. So he not, it's not just about having a vineyard. It's not just about having your own. It's about looking around you and seeing, wow, this went wrong in this area, this went wrong in this area, this went wrong. How can I learn from that? At the nine o'clock, I talked about a gentleman named Richard Branson. Anybody familiar with him? Yeah. Oh yeah, business entrepreneurs know who he is. He owns the brand Virgin, like the airlines, Virgin Airlines, that's him. All him. Matter of fact, they are merging with Alaska Airlines. I remember when Virgin Airlines was like the brand new thing and you know, you don't want to try a new plane because it might not work. <laughs> you know, new planes that don't work is, mm, that's an investment. But now they are a certified airline brand. What I didn't know about Richard Branson was how many times that man failed. Good God, he failed. They, he, tried to, he tried to start Virgin uh, Cosmetics. <laughs> you know, some things just sound different when you're in church versus when you're not. So he tried to start a line called Virgin Cosmetics and they were like, no, nah, I'm not wearing that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not. He actually tried to start Virgin uh, Automotive. So he tried to do the Tesla thing, but come out with cars called Virgin Cars. He was like, people were like, no, I'm not gonna drive those. <laughs> not happening. He tried Virgin Cola. People were like, no, nah, I'm not gonna drink that. <laughs> they failed badly and very publicly. I didn't put the dots together. When I grew up, there was a thing called the Virgin Megastore. Some heads know about the Virgin Megastore. The Virgin Megastore was, and this is a, a, a crazy concept, it was a building where you walked in and you paid for your music and they gave you the music in your hand. You could feel it, like you had it in your, it was the music, it was right there. And you would take this thing in your hand and you would put it in this other thing in your car and the music would come out. It was wild. It just blows my mind thinking about it. We click buttons and download. He was like, no, 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 walk in the building. That's what we did back in the day. This was one of the biggest music out uh, retailers ever. It crashed. Meaning technology overtook it because our generation now clicks a button and we got the music right there. We don't walk in the stores anymore to buy music unless we're DJs. His market suffered from not understanding the curve of technology, but guess what he then did? He took that knowledge 
And he was one of the first to put the internet on the plane. The failure of this vineyard here brought forth the harvest in this vineyard here because he analyzed where he went wrong and learned from that mistake. The minute those planes came out, he was like, oh, the internet? Y'all gonna have internet on your planes. Watch. I don't care how slow it is, you're gonna love it. And people did and do. But he learned. He was able to analyze the failure. Right now, there are close to 400 brands under the Virgin, companies under the Virgin brand. There are about 14 or 15 of them that failed spectacularly. But he learned from all of them. And that's how you build an empire. That is how you sustain a harvest, is when you meditate on your success, but you analyze your failure. That's how you value the full experience of your life. Your failures are worth just as much, maybe, if not more, than your successes. Because your failure, is, your failure was not designed to be your misery, it was designed to be your tool. It's supposed to teach, not kill you. This last piece, the last principle for harvesting wisdom, number four, gather knowledge. Let's look at the last two verses, verses 33 and 34. We're going to go back to our man in our barren vineyard. A little sleep. Actually, can we go back to 32? We'll flow right into it. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it, received instruction. This was the instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, so shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. The first time I read that, I was like, man, that's deep. That's just so deep. And then I was like, yet familiar. That verse we've seen before. That verse is Proverbs 6, 10 through 11. Knowledge that had been acquired earlier, knowledge that had been meditated on and stored away, knowledge that is inside of you right now is just waiting for the experience in front of you to be married to it to become wisdom. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, so shall poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. The instruction, the correction that he received in this moment wasn't new. It was something he already knew, but it was now reinforced. Sometimes we learn lessons and we learn them tangentially. We learn them from a book and it makes sense, it does. But then when you take what you learn from the book, and you marry it to something in front of you, in a life experience, it, is, it bonds to you in a way that it could never have bonded with you if you didn't have the experience attached to it. That's why I love this situation so much. This is wisdom happening in real live time. He saw something, he meditated on it, he focused on it, and knowledge that had already been stored up. See, when you're in your word all day, every day, when you meditate on the word of God, it just comes out of you. And you'll find you will have the dysfunction in front of you. And while everybody else is trying to figure out what to do, you already have the supernatural principle to restore that dysfunction to a harvest. He looked at that barren vineyard and knew exactly what was wrong. He's like, oh, laziness. Got it. No Google, no Siri, how do I fix a barren, none of that. He pulled a principle from the word of God and is now ready to apply it, so now his vineyard will not look like that. So now the dysfunction in front of him will no longer be a part of him. We have to be ready to take the word that we meditate on and stew on and read and apply it. That's what makes the word live. That's what makes the word living. The word is not alive if it just stays in the book and you memorize it. 
That's just knowledge. Knowledge is great to have. But watch this. There are fools with knowledge. There are fools with knowledge. There are people who know that which to do, but do not do. And if you are around people who always have advice, but their life doesn't add up, you know that the wisdom harvesting is off. I was talking earlier about, you know, trying to get in shape. I can't take advice about fitness from somebody who's not as fit as I am. Am I the only one who thinks that's strange? <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense. Because I'm going to look and be like, I don't see the fruit. <laughs> what you're saying sounds great, but I don't see the fruit. If you're gonna train me, you gotta, you gotta look like you outwork me. <laughs> I can't look like I do what you do easily. Because now I should be training you. You need to give me some money. Clearly, I'm in the wrong business. I just discovered a revenue stream, and I came to get trained. Out of order. I want to look at these last two words, and I'm going to get everybody out of here. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. This image always perks me up because it keeps me sharp. It was the image of getting of having someone prowl, poverty like a prowler. Like, I'm from New York, okay? And so, when you say prowler to me, we got problems. My mind views prowler as somebody who lurks in the alley and is ready to stick me for my loot. And I'm not really trying to live that life of getting stuck for my loot and your need like an armed man. I don't want anybody running up on me with arms, unless you're trying to give me a hug. And even then, we gotta clear that. You don't just run up on me. That gets a little weird, hold up. But we have to analyze what these words really mean, because I promise you it's so much deeper than just that. Poverty we get, that's lack, that's need. But this word prowler actually just means Someone who walks back and forth. That's it. Not nobody trying to rob you, nobody's trying to stick you. Just back and forth. So a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. This is what happens when you don't harvest wisdom. This is what happens when there's laziness in the spirit. This is what happens when there's laziness in the mind. This is what happens when you don't hone your perspective. This is what happens when you don't value your experience. All of these things, here is the payoff. Your poverty comes like a prowler. Your poverty comes, your poverty comes and goes. Your poverty comes and your poverty goes. Literally, that word prowler means to come to and fro, to come and go. I would rather poverty just come stick me one good time, <laughs> take my loot. I know it's Friday, I just got paid. God will provide, fine. <laughs> I would rather get stuck one good time than have a prowler come to. And I don't want poverty coming in and out of my life. What is that? Get me one time and go. If ever. It says poverty will come like a, pro a prowler. Poverty is going to come in and out of your life arbitrarily. It's not even looking for you, but because you are out of purpose, because you are out of order, because you are out of destiny, because you are out of harvest, you're in line with poverty. And it's just going to walk in and walk out with your money. And I wish that all it took was your money, but poverty will come for your mind which is worth so much more than your money. Poverty will come for your spirit, which is worth so much more than your money. Poverty comes and goes, and it's not coming for your wallet. It's coming to take that which God has given you, which is you. 
so shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. When I saw this, I said, ah, need is armed? Need is coming for me like that? Oh, really? Okay, well, yeah, I'm a... But then I look up this word armed. Armed is not a weapon. The definition of this word armed is a shield. It's a shield or a hedge of protection. So in other words, your need will have a hedge of protection and a shield against you. And I couldn't figure out why it would be that need would need to shield itself from me. I thought need was coming to get me, yet need sees me as a danger in a way that it has to arm and shield itself from me. You mean I'm the dangerous one in this problem? Wait a minute. We have a very negative connotation with need. Because when we think of need, we think of that which is essential, which we do not have or cannot gain. But that's not what need is. Need is just essential. Right now, I'm thirsty. I need water. This is not my enemy. It's water. It's a need. It's a basic need. It's an essential need. Everybody needs water. What if you were in a desert and you were dehydrated and your lips were cracked and you were thirsty and you're sweating and you're just about to die and you get this bottle of water and you finally twist it open and you pour it out and the water jumps out of the bottle and says no. <laughs> That's my need. You're here to refresh me. Why are you running away from me? It's out of order. That's out of nature. Water doesn't run away from your mouth unless you're clumsy. But yet it says your need will be like an armed man. You see, when we are not harvesting wisdom, we will find that that which we need, which is supposed to be attracted to us, which is supposed to come towards us, which we're supposed to lay hold of and have command over, is instead shielding itself from us and running away from us. Because God provides need where there is purpose and destiny. And if it ain't purpose and destiny, the resources are going to run away from you instead of running towards you. And we cannot get towards purpose and destiny without harvesting wisdom. I don't want my need to run away from me. When Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy, he said, I have need, send the man. And the man say to the man, I have need for that donkey. He wasn't worried. And the donkey didn't run away from him. I have need for it. It's mine. My needs are supposed to be there because I trust that God will provide for them. But a poverty mentality, when poverty is prowling on you and coming in and out and making its way to and fro through your life, your mind becomes corrupted by the poverty that comes and goes and says, need should not be here. That which I need should not be here. And now need is looking at you like I can't go towards you because you are not eligible to do that which God has told you to do. I'm closing. I need to close. Let's put up those last four principles before we go. So when we harvest wisdom, understand harvesting wisdom can happen in the blink of an eye, in any experience, at any point in time. It can happen in the supermarket. It can happen in the park. It can happen at the beach. It can happen in your own home. There's always opportunities. There are infinite opportunities to harvest and reap from wisdom. We just have to set our minds to it and become so accustomed to living a lifestyle of harvesting wisdom. Stuff teaches you that doesn't teach everybody. Number one, root out laziness. Two, hone your perspective. Three, value the fullness of your experience. And four, if I can't say this enough, gather knowledge. Gather knowledge at every turn. Get it where you can get it. 
If you have the app on your phone, you have the verse coming in through email, whatever it takes, and I speak specifically about the word of God, gather knowledge. Spend as much time in the word as you do in social media, if not more. That might be a challenge for someone right now. I dare you, take 30 days and the time you would allot to any social media app, allot it to the word of God. And allot it, fix your mind to looking at situations and saying, how can I apply what I've already read? You'll be shocked how much your life changes. Let's stand. Right now, in this place, there is a hunger, a hunger for the Spirit to remain within us, a hunger for the Spirit to infiltrate all of our lives, all the areas of our lives, and that hunger will be quenched when we master harvesting wisdom. And it says in the Word that the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom is God. If you know you don't have that relationship with God where you can call on him and receive that quick, instantaneous wisdom, if you don't trust God enough that he will fill in all of your blanks, if you have not begun the faith walk that is allowing space for God to operate and keep your hands out, if you want to start today, come on down to this altar. Come on down. Come on down. I can tell you when I did that walk, the change began. The word opened. The transformation began. The spirit expanded. The mind expanded. The way I see the word now, the way the word inspires my life began when I took the same steps that some of you are brave and bold enough to take right now. Come on down. Let's start walking. Let's start harvesting wisdom. Next group of people I would like to call down here. If there is an area in your life where you know the harvest is not what God called it to be. If you know there has been prowling, if you know the armed man that is need, let us disarm the armed man today. Come on down. There is no area of your mind that should have the seed of poverty in it. Come on down. We will remove that seed today, this moment. Come on down. Come on down. God has given you a vision for an incredible harvest. And what you have now doesn't match that vision. Come on down. Let's get some new steps. Let's get a new process. Everyone in here has the potential to be a storehouse of wisdom. People should be coming to you for wisdom. Come on down. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have opened up heaven's windows and truly poured out what we could not count or imagine in wisdom that you've poured it out in understanding, that you've poured it out in discernment, that you've poured it out in knowledge. Father, thank you for speaking to a need greater than the one we had on our minds when we came in here today. We thank you, Father God, that you have replaced the seed of poverty and you, we have replaced the seed of need with the seed of harvest. So Father, rain forth your word. I pray, Father God, that every eye in this place, every ear that is receiving this message will now look upon the word in a fresh new way. Let us be hungry for your word, Father. Let us harvest as farmers do, Lord God, tilling the soil and digging and digging and digging and patiently sowing and waiting with the anticipation that your word reaps 
brings forth harvest that we will reap, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that every single circumstance must bow to the knowledge that you will supply for all my needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus. Right now, we command, we declare, and we decree that we have the harvest mindset from this moment forward. Poverty, take a seat. From this moment forward, when we hear need, we will smile because we know you already provided for it. Need will be our friend because our need signals we are close to destiny and close to purpose and close to the awakening that you've called for us. Need is now an ally where it was once an enemy. Father, we say right now our perspective has shifted and changed Bring forth the supernatural perspective that we may view this world according to your eyes and not our own. And may we walk knowing that, Father, you have planned it, you have said it, you have spoken it, and so it will be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.